Good morning. Welcome to this workshop of the Irodi project. Welcome to the European Biomass Conference and Exhibition. Thank you for for hosting us today in 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 this uh, conference is quiet today we don't know it is because the last uh, dinners <laughs> last dinners uh, last night and uh, yes we are very happy to to be here uh, to to almost conclude this European project that was uh, a great project that we developed all of us in the last uh, in the last uh, three years. And today we are going to focus um, not only in the project details and conclusions and advances as well in, in the general uh, processes and valorization that can be done to valorize the byproducts from the vegetable oil refining production. So we have a, a, a panel of speakers with a huge expertise on these um, processes, with these feedstocks, with as well with the um, environmental and social aspects. So we really uh, would like you enjoy this this workshop. You find it useful, and we really would like to to be able to contribute to the advance and implementation of biocircularity, bioeconomy in our industries and, and territories. We would like to, to open this session with a, a video of our project in which we show some uh, achievements and some um, advances and some conclusions and our vision as well from the scientific, technical and the industrial side. So, as a as a welcome to this to this workshop, we are going to to start with this with this video. By the baby, I now see the E where the wrong partner both from industrial profile and also research institutes work together in the development of an industrial process based on the economy and circular. In particular, we work with the realization incidents, which are the products of the vegetable oil refining process. We work in new green technologies for the extraction of mineral valuable components present in the realization industry. In Italy, we have obtained natural surfactants, biodegradable biorhythms, and biopolyols, which are going to be used in the formulation of biobased acids. Biomass is key in the transition towards an in zero emission scenario. We need to move away from the use of fossil fuels for energy, but also for materials. By progress of a bright future. The demand is growing, driven by government's net zero target, and increasingly environmentally conscious customers, which demand sustainable solutions from companies. <laughs> In China, we have replaced in some commercial metallic formulations the petroleum based surfactants with the surfactant iodine. And the best results have been obtained in cleaning and releasing or capsule tests. Mm -hmm. 
We are interested in using these alternative products in our cleaners because using biodegradable materials such as biodegradable products helps us to improve the environmental impact of our products and reduce emissions. We also make use of material works by putting them in new uses. This is our contribution to bioeconomy and circular economy. In manufacture, we are well aware of our responsibility with the environment. Sustainability is in cleaner DNA. Participating in this project has been a very enriching experience, and considering the very positive results that we have achieved, encourage us to participate in more projects in the future. By economy means using renewable biological resources from crops, forests, animals, microorganisms, waste to produce food, energy, biofuels, and biobased materials. Stronger development of the bioeconomy will help the European Union accelerate progress towards a circular and low carbon economy. Mm -hmm. It will help modernize and strengthen the European industrial base, creating new value chains and greener to more cost efficient industrial processes while protecting biodiversity and the environment. Ironic mm -hmm. project clearly illustrates how an industrial bioeconomy model can successfully work. So this is our project in a nutshell, and uh, this is just the beginning of uh, many other research and innovation activities, lines, and uh, as well, the, the integration of all of these in industries. That's, that is the, the, the main aim and uh, greener industries and have more sustainable products and production chains. So we are going to start this workshop going into depth in some of these aspects. And now we have the, um, the opening presentation and as well the feedstocks, which is the, the most important and, and the beginning. So it's going to start uh, first, uh, the coordinators, maybe one sec, yes, uh, with the sorry, opening, sorry. just introducing <laughs> introducing the, the project, and um, thank you, thank you very much. For any questions, uh, we have, after this session, uh, uh, some minutes to, to have uh, okay. questions and, and debate or whatever you think. Thank you very much. So I guess I have to speak from here, no? Maybe for the people in the in the Zoom, eh? let's, let's follow from here. So uh, I'm gonna start with the opening. I'm gonna cover because we will have the whole morning to to get into the details. But um, as Margarita said, we are not gonna get maybe to the numbers, but well to to the technologies, to the broader use of what we have developed where we could be applied. But before we go to that one, that is dedicated the workshop to, I'd like to to present Nirodi from the perspective of why we are doing this project, not what we are doing, that we will come later the whole morning on it, but why. And here in this audience, I don't need to, to convince you or to tell you what are the what are we thinking or what is the European Union and in general the world towards the need zero scenario, the well, we will stop 2050, 2060, sooner or later. In few decades, we will stop using uh, fossil fuels, and it is clear. No, also in this conference, we have been hearing, okay, biofuels. How we will replace the fossil fuels by other other alternatives, electrification for for generation of energy. But fossil fuels are or fossil feedstocks are also used to make materials, plastics, solvents, paints. Well, a whole range of and from there also a lot of all the polymers and and, and therefore the plastics. So. When fossil, use, fossil fuels are no longer used, what will be used? 
Well, uh, we'll have to use what this term renewable carbon. This is from coming from, from recycling, from, from CO2, either from CO2 direct capture or from, or from point source capture, but from CO2 and finally also from, from biomass. And biomass is already used for chemicals, but only to a very small percent. And if you see here in the image in the, on the right, 10%, only 10% of the, of the chemicals and here chemicals also account for organic chemicals, uh, monomers, broad sense of chemicals talking, only 10% of them are, are bio-based. So to cover the whole wheel, there is a lot of work to, to still, still to do. And here in the, of course, we are in the European Biomass Conference. So, and also this project is about using biomass. But we see the use of biomass, only a very small percentage, 0 0.1, this is data for the EU, only 0.1% of the whole use of biomass goes to chemicals. And you can also see it in the conference, most of the uses goes to biofuels, or, or well, there's also yeah, not that much covered in the conference, but animal feed, material uses. Those, the, those are good uses of, 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 uh, of, bio, of, of biomass, but certainly bio-based chemicals have a lot of a, a long run and a huge potential because the, the percentage is small. And probably many of you are familiar with this chart. This is the petrochemical chart, how everything is derived from, at the end, the crude oil and natural gas. And from there, you derive all the products that, that today the chemical industry. And therefore, then later from here, the, you go all the way up to finally to all the products. You look around, you will see all the plastics, uh, cosmetics, everything has petrochemicals on it. Well, now we have the challenge to replace the feedstock, the fossil-based fossil, fossil -based feedstock by bio-based feedstock, among other feedstocks, or other renewable feedstock. And, and here we will have to start from different, um, different materials, but this is technically is feasible. And I also want to, to emphasize, because the technical part maybe is more known, but also economically, the fact of using biomass for bio-based chemicals makes sense. And here, uh, well, maybe it's a complex chart. I just want to, to point you to, to this second uh, rectangle, which is showing the price that bio-based chemicals can have. And this other horizontal rectangle means uh, represent the average price of biomass. And as you see, solid wood products and then chemicals are the most profitable materials and more profitable uses of, of biomass. If we, if the, um, um, subsidies, for example, are removed. This is just from a market perspective. So both technically and economically makes sense to make bio-based products from, from biomass. Now, this is, I think, the use of biomass, I think is, is clear, especially this conference, this audience. But I think we are focusing on the feedstock and, and it's very important, but certainly equally important is the end of life. We cannot only consider uh, the use of that the is renewable, the use of, of the feedstock we use, but also that then what happens with the material at the end of life, we cannot start using biomass to make a modeling, which at the end we discard the products as we do, and we contribute to more, to more waste. So we have to incorporate the circularity also. And this is uh, the combination of bio-based and, and the circularity, I think it's also very related with the with how is Irodi the whole idea of Irodi, and and certainly is what nature also we have to learn again from nature how nature nature of course is bio no and it's also circular there is no concept of waste doesn't exist in nature and what we have to go towards that model and today especially Irodi project is about how to make to close some of those cycles from waste, from bio-based waste in this case, to new bio-based products. And with this, I, I leave the, the floor now to, to Olga to, to really go now into the overview of, the, of what Irodi is about. Thank you very much, Pablo. Okay. 
We have seen the, situ the current situation about the fossil fuels, the fossil resources, and the biomass resources. And now we are going to center in, in the oil and fat industry. We have to think that the oil and fat industry is also affected by all the things that Pablo has commented before. The oil and fat uh, processing generates lots of residual materials that many of them can be reused for further application of commercial value. Spe specifically in this project, we are focused on the refining of vegetable oils and fats. The uh, refining of vegetable oils is made to convert the vegetable oils into edible oils. One step of this process is named as deodorization. The deodorization is made to eliminate from the vegetable oils uh, all the compounds that can give uh, bad flavors, but others are uh, or can be toxic. In consequence, uh, a residual uh, source is generated, named as deodorization distillates. The deodorization distillates are composed by free fatty acid and other glyceric compounds, but also they contain uh, different proportions of mineral valuable compounds, for example, such, uh, esqualene and different esterols as tocopherol, etc., that have a very important commercial interest. Okay. Who can I pass there? Okay, now. Nowadays, the principal commercial value of the deodorization distillates is uh, the lies in the content of esqualene. Esqualene is, uh, was traditionally obtained from sharks. But now, other alternative sources as vegetable sources gain uh, importance. Tocopherol are also other mineral components present in the deodorization distillates that have an important value. Esqualene is used for cosmetic applications and tocopherols are used for nutraceutical applications. On the other hand, the fatty component of the recession distillate is currently uh, employed for energetic applications such as the uh, biodiesel production. Uh, nowadays, the process used to valorize the recession distillates consists in the separation of the more valuable compounds, squalene and tocopherol, by uh, distillation techniques. These uh, techniques uh, are uh, energetically intensive because they use uh, high temperatures and a low vacuum, and this temperature can affect to the quality of these uh, components of the squalene and tocopherol. Uh, in this project, we propose to develop new green uh, technologies that can operate to separate the mineral valuable compounds from the fatty compounds using softer conditions than the traditional ones. But also, we work in the valorization of the fatty content of the deodorization distillate, obtaining products of higher value than biodiesel. Irodi, for us, uh, the uh, circular by, by economy, we could propose an integral valorization of the, the, the recession distillates, uh, of uh, obtaining the maximum profit from them. On the other hand, as I have as I have explained before, we uh, have worked developing new green techno technologies to extract the some compounds. Uh, interesting compounds from the deorization distillates. We have uh, the developed process for uh, supercritical CO2 extraction and ionic liquid uh, extraction. And on the other hand, we have converted the fatty content of the deorization distillates in uh, green surfactants, and biodegradable biolubricants, and uh, new polyols that can be used in the formulation of uh, bio based adhesives. Uh, Irodi forces the bioeconomy how it uh, Irodi promotes the use of, uh, of alternative raw materials instead of petrol derived ones. It promotes the use of domestic resources, not imports. Uh, the technologies developed uh, 
operates under uh, greener and softer condition, no generating toxic residual materials. Uh, it uh, generates more competence because new biobased products are uh, appear, uh, can be appear in the market. On the other hand, uh, Irodi also fosters circular economy because it, uh, uh, it fosters the revalorization of industrial residual, uh, residues with more efficient process uh, by the designing of new products and improved the competitiveness. Here you have the general scheme of the Irodi concept. The derization uh, distillates are um, uh, uh, the, that are composed uh, by fatty components and uh, other manual valuable components, for example, as squalene and tocopherol, etc. We uh, work in uh, the uh, in new technologies, as for example, supercritical CO2 extraction and ionic glucose extraction, to obtain uh, squalene and tocopherol of very high quality using. Uh, low temperatures that can preserve the natural quality of these products. On the other hand, we combine the fatty content of the uh, derivation distillates with uh, benign ionic liquids to obtain new uh, surfactants. Uh, we also uh, modify the fatty uh, content of the derivation distillates with uh, uh, by enzym enzymatic esterifications to obtain base oils for new biolubricants, biodegradable biolubricants, and also we obtain, we are uh, working on the development of new biopolyols that can be, uh, that will give uh, new biobased polyurethanes. Well, as a brief summary of the technologies that you are going to to see in the next uh, presentations, I would like to introduce the, the, the research work carried out in the biodegradable surfactants uh, synthesis with innovative properties. Here, we combine the derivation distillates with benign in ionic liquids to obtain new green surfactants that are biodegradable, non-toxic, and are harmless to the human. Uh, they are not toxic at all. They have uh, improved, uh, uh, improved properties in comparison with other uh, traditional surfactants. For example, they, are, they have uh, a higher solubility in cold water, or they can show a, a bigger uh, or better efficiency than other surfactants. In the case of the uh, obtention of biodegradable biolubricants, here we work with two residual streams. On the other hand, we work with the decision distillates and also we use glycerol, which is a subproduct of the biodiesel production. Uh, both reactants are uh, uh, combined using enzymatic esterification to obtain base oils which are the main components for uh, biodegradable biolubricants. Enzymatic esterifications are a very selective uh, reaction which uh, use a smooth uh, operational conditions and do not generate at all toxic residual materials. Uh, uh, talking about the uh, Minor valuable compounds extraction, such as uh, esqualene and tocopherol, they have been extracted using techniques as, for example, supercritical CO2 extraction or ionic liquid extraction. In the first case, we have obtained a very good results to uh, extract esqualene of very high quality esqualene and with high yields using supercritical CO2 which is a very clean technology that, uh, that uh, uses uh, low uh, operational temper temperatures and do does not generate any residual materials. Uh, finally, we will also work in the converting the chemical structure, structure of the free fatty acids present 
in the deorization distillates and other molecules that can be reactive with uh, different isogenates to obtain polyurethanes, which are uh, being used to develop um, uh, bio-based polyurethanes. The squalene that we are obtaining by supercritical uh, CO2 extraction is used in the formulation of new cosmetic um, creams uh, with uh, very uh, high uh, yields and with high uh, properties and quality. Finally, I would like to remark that all the uh, results and data obtained on the project are uh, have been analyzed from the technological, economical, uh, environmental, and uh, societal uh, point of view in order to maximize the benefits uh, that can be uh, derived from the technologies developed. We can, we have to think that we can uh, uh, exploit, uh, further exploit these technologies uh, alone. Uh, individually, and they can be integrated in a whole process, maximizing the uh, the ERD benefits. And this is all. Uh, and now I would like to uh, pass to my colleague Marie from the from materials. Thank you, Olga, Pablo, coordinators of IRODI from Tecnalia. Now, Maribi from the Instituto de la Grasa in Spain. Thank you, Maribi. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to talk about um, what, why we are decided to work with the Dreiser Distillate. Well, first I work in the Instituto de la Grasa, that is a center belong to the CSIC, Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, what is, which is the, the most important research uh, institution in Spain with 25 uh, centers in diverse material, not only physical, bioeconomy, social humanities, etc. And in the Instituto de la Grasa was founded in 19, 47 uh, to develop studies related with uh, oils and oil derivatives uh, uh, or derivatives materials as uh, table olives, for example. We have food services, technical services, and also research uh, institution, research services. In this, in this moment, I would like to talk about some points that I like to highlight related with refining because in fact we have only 10 minutes. So I am going to center in this point, the, the markets of olive, of the global market of oils, the byproducts of interest and why the DOD are the most interesting for us. The difficulties of analysis and our part in the in the this project, the EROD project. First, uh, I would like to remark that the, we have the product, the global market production uh, in the world is around 215 million metric tons of oils, and it's growing. It's growing, uh, and then it's expected to to, to overpass 3, 000, uh, 300 million tons in in 2030. That's because it's a good material for 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 we have. We are going to have disponibility, in special for the main oils that are palm oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, and uh, uh, rapeseed oil. Rapeseed oil and sunflower oil uh, occupies the third and fourth position and is depending on the harvest of the year. No? And of course, in Spain, I have to talk about olive oil, that Europe is the main producer in the world. The, the oil is, is in particular 20, 95% of release rights, but in fact, the, the, the uh, characteristic of the oils depends on the fatty acid that comprises the triglyceride. And if they are saturated fatty acids, as in the case of palm oil that is in, in orange in this slide, uh, the, the oils are um, solids and stables in the future. 
However, when we have we have more polyunsaturated fatty acid, the, the oil resorts liquid and prone to oxidation to rancidity. That is the main difference in uh, between the oils, you know. And uh, why we have to refine the oils is because we extracted the main of us, the majority of us, with hexane. And hexane extracted not only the triglycerides, but, but also components of the membrane that cover the, the glycerides in the, in the seeds. For example, uh, pol, um, phospholipids or steroids. That's because we found uh, that kind of lipid compounds in the oils, but also uh, free fatty acids that can be because of the biosynthesis not uh, finished uh, are prone to oxidation of the oil. That's because we have to convert the non-edible oils in edible oils and can be done by physical or chemical refine that uh, as shown before uh, Olga, the, the, there are different steps. The chemical refining cons, uh, consists of the gumming with phosphoric acid to, uh, to remove the phospholipid. We have alkali refining with soda that obtains soap stocks, the pastas. And after that, we can winterize the oil. Uh, the oil is uh, cooled enough to uh, remove the solid fraction that can be uh, put in the, in the bottles that, because we have to think about the consumers. The consumer likes the, a very brilliant, clear oil without any solid particle. After that, the oil is bleached with bleaching earth and the bleaching earth uh, retain about 50% of, the, of the, the weight that you add of bleaching earth in the oil to remove pigments, uh, color compounds, not only carotenoids or chlorophyll, but also uh, that uh, compounds that are oxidized and give brown color. And finally, the odorization uh, that is a steam distillation in order to remove odors and uh, stabilize the oil because promoted the oxidation inside the odorizer and remove the, the result of the reaction that give us uh, rancidity odors. That because the odorization is the most important part in the, in the complete uh, refining process because it's the final point of the oil that the consumer is going to, to have. Well, if we try to work with soft stocks, soft stocks are emotional and have a lot of water. That because in the industry, they are, uh, the, the soaps are bricks with a solid uh, sulfuric acid in order to obtain only the oil phase. And this oil phase uh, suffer a lot of oxidation because of the sulfuric acid. In the case of the deodorization, oil distillates is more clean the situation. In the physical refining, for example, if you, um, it's a, it's a step that is work under vacuum and depends on the vacuum and the temperature that you use to um, deodorize the oil. You are going to stay different composition in the oil deodorization distillate. Um, well, in this case, I have no to, to the way to, to, to point in the, in, the, in the slide, but you can see that. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, in the middle. Okay. Okay. If you put. Okay. Thank you. If you put one millibar, for example, and two hundred and fifty degrees, you are going to distillate all of this kind of thing. Not only free fatty acid, but also tocopherols and esterols. These are the composition of the residue in the distillation. And the distillate that you are going to obtain is practically free fatty acid, hydrocarbons, small uh, part of the uh, carbon change in the material, also fatty esters, but triglyceride, diglyceride, and monoglyceride, you say they, they are not distilling, yes, but if you introduce steam inside the deodorizer, small um, drops of oils are entrained with the deodorization. Uh, vapors 
and appears in the in the distillate. That's because we can find that kind of compound. The authorization is very very clean because it is this the, the authorization plan of the of the of my institute. You enter the steam, cross the column, and recuperate all of the distillates in the scrubber, but only lipid fraction. Any other types of compounded soaps, water, etc. So the main difference are that you, well, you you know that the byproducts, sorry, but the byproducts of a refining process, um, the price is um, put by the content of tocopherols and styrols. That because I show in this slide the difference between chemical refining and physical refining and acid oil. That is the results of brick uh, soap stock with sulfuric acid, acid oil. Acid oil doesn't appear any amount of tocopherol because they are antioxidants. However, depending on the nature of the oil, you can find in the, in the distillate more or less amount of tocopherols. And in the case of um, physical refining is because the amount of free fatty acid that have to be removed in the case of physical refining. Well, in our case, we have found this type of, of the odorizer distillate. We have worked mainly with sunflower, olive uh, oil, and olive foam oil, uh, the odorizer distillate. And you, can, and you can see that the main compounds in the olive oil physical refining are free fatty acid, but in the case of olive pomace oil that are chemical refined, and we have an special step alkali refining to remove the fatty acids, we found the main amount of fatty esters, okay? And the different uh, composition of the mineral amount, the mineral valuable compounds. The compounds can be squalene in different proportion. Of course, olive oil are the maximum. Steroids that can, this is in percentage, I see. Steroids that we can find around say so 0.2 or 5%. And tocopherols in our case have had been PPMs only because we have worked with oil that their nature is not enough to obtain that kind of a valuable compound. The difficulties of the analysis to control this process is very high because in fact, the matrix are not triglycerides and all of the, um, analytical method standards, the standards analytical method are devoted to triglyceride and other things. In our case are free fatty acids and another thing. The medium is different. So we have to select what uh, analytical control have to be done. So we uh, decide to study the global composition because as Olga mentioned before, we are interested in the not uh, minor compounds. We are interested in the major compounds. We have analyzed, uh, uh, in particular, estelons and ispoline. In the case of reaction with water, we have used spectrophotometry. And we also, we have a challenge with contaminant because as mentioned before, all of the cleanup uh, standards have made by triglycerols and, and other contaminants in our case. We have suffered a lot because we decided to saponify the samples before um, analyze the contaminants. This is our, our a protocol to analyze the oil. We have using SEPA with amino uh, field, amino propyl field, in order to remove the free fatty acid. And by HP uh, size exclusion chromatography, we can distinguish be between the main compounds of that we can find in the in the the other acid distillate, the triglyceride, the glyceride mono, and free fatty acid. And after that, the two fractions let us study more accurately our hydrocarbons, or in the fraction B the more polar compounds as tocopherols, esterol, et cetera. We have proposed a, a method in order to analyze in particular esqualine and, and esterols, including internal standard by methylation. We analyze directly the, the composition of the oil, of the distillate. 
uh, related with the fatty acid composition. Uh, after silanization of the result of the reaction, we can analyze by GC the amount of squalene as esterol I have been published in a few, in, in a short time. In our, in our project, uh, we have worked with, with Fejekon, with Inga, and with um, Ilya in the ionic liquid part in order to obtain the minor value compounds. Um, in our case, we, we have centered in Esqualine and Esterol, with good resources sometimes. Uh, uh, Inga now is going to show you. Uh, in the Tuta de Grasa, we have done the uh, test related with the short path distillation. That is the common technology used for, for separation of these values compound centered in the isolation of uh, squalene and uh, in the residue tocopherols and tocopherols. And also we have a uh, test the enzymatic, uh, the, the reaction products of the enzymatically neutralized DOD by the, the interaction with with Melanie in the work back is free. We, you can get more information in some publications that we have uh, made along this, uh, this project. And I would like to, to, to ask any, if you have to ask any question, if not, thank you at all for your, for your attention. Thank you. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mariby, Pablo, Olga. Now it's time for questions, suggestions, comments. Yes. Just a quick question because we need to concentrate squalene and tocopherols to a higher and higher value. Do you use also molecular distillation? Yes, of course. We have prepared the sample pre treating with pre treatments uh, with ionic liquid, with enzymatical reaction. After that, we have compared short path distillation, molecular distillation, with the extraction with uh, a superior critical CO2 in order to get the best result for, for the squalene and tocopherols and esterol isolation. And to, to get your stream until 70% of purity of the substance? In the or? case of Squalene, for example, only with um, reaction um, uh, directly with the directly uh, obtention, we only obtain thirty five percent of squalene. If we have not any pretreatment, in the case of the pretreatment, we can obtain practically ninety percent. But the hard romaine or is going to show you a little bit more. It would be maybe to clarify that's part of the later it will we will cover also also that part part of the supercritical extraction and then also for the romaine the part of the specifically squalene so may, I think you will be more information also later sure thank you excellent there is another question over here yes That was a nice presentation, I quite enjoyed it. And my question is, my name is Maureen from University of Surrey in England. And my question is, um, when refining these uh, vegetable oils that um, byproducts, have you ever considered other sources, for example, um, crude glycerol from or glycerol from biodiesel industries uh, that their waste streams uh, from biodiesel industries have you considered in adding them to uh, part of your uh, uh, substrates that you can use for production of sustainable bio-based products mm -hmm. for example i've worked with um crude glycerol from biodiesel industry used in production of um, succinic acid uh, using Yarrowia lipolytica. So have you considered other ways that you can get crude glycerol or byproducts from oils, say biodiesel industry? Thank you for, for your question. Of course, uh, the results or the idea that uh, we have shown to the audience today is a start point 
for developing uh, new bioproducts bio are to show that the, the potential of the technologies that we are working in, but uh, we can apply this technology with other uh, uh, residual sources, not all the research and distillates, and also with uh, other products, for example, with crude glycerol, et cetera. Uh, we, we are also in, in other uh, a research project uh, working on uh, specific technologies for purification of the uh, crude glycerol uh, with uh, employing uh, lower temperatures and and uh, uh, this is a uh, these are good candidates for being used in the de development of new bioproducts this is an example of the potential of the technologies that can be uh, 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 explored in other uh, equivalent applications as uh, i have said in the, in the in the presentation the general presentation they can be uh, used the technologies alone Oh, uh, we have, as Maribi has said, we have also uh, obtained very good results combining technologies, combining, for example, extraction technologies uh, first and next, uh, the valorization uh, of uh, com uh, com uh, com uh, transforming the fatty content in 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 uh, the derivative product or or in the opposite. We can, for example, convert. The fatty content of the the in distillates in esters, and then uh, apply the supercritical situ extraction. And uh, with uh, this combination, we maximize the uh, the yields, uh, the purity of the compounds, and the benefits. In, in, in this... As it's mainly composed by uh, FFA and methyl esters or ethyl esters, mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of glycerin uh, because you don't have a lot of um, monoglycerides, deglycerides, and triglycerides. Mm -hmm. Please. Mm -hmm. online, online participants are not hearing you. Ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, come back again. So DOD are not composed by a lot of glycerides, mono D and tri. So uh, you will not have a lot of glycerol um, coming out the process. So maybe that's why we didn't focus mainly in this part. But it's a really good question because there is a lot of things about glycerol uh, as a, to make different products. But yeah. it's more for vegetable oils uh, processing. Sorry. And also, Melanie, perhaps can help us because she <laughs> no, has yeah. used glycerol with uh, transesterifications uh, in the in the world package three mm -hmm. but it's later so she, she yes. perhaps is going to say later okay thank you for your also talk promise. later about it but i use uh, glycerol for esterification process um i use the glycerol for esterification um Enzymatic esterification process, but I will um, with I that kind of distillates uh -huh. also. In uh -huh. my, I will show it in my presentation. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. You say your name and application. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, Eric Peterson, Institut National de Recherche Scientifique, Quebec, Canada. Uh, I've seen some very interesting results uh, using. Uh, uh, fatty acid distillates from cocoa for cocoa deodorization of cocoa butter, uh, I'm able to convert it into single cell protein. Now, I find that the uh, molecules that are residual, like these interesting uh, uh, bioactive mo molecules, play a stimulatory effect on uh, microorganisms. And I'm wondering if, there, if you have, uh, have any similar observations to that effect. Perhaps. The, we have uh, the, our interest is to use it in oleochemicals industry, not for for microorganism or or nutritional points. But in any case, has been uh, made um, microbiological studies related with the surfactants that have been obtained in order to and demonstrate that they have not suffered any 
any other danger for the for the natures. But our interest is only in oleochemical industry. In this case, in particular, of course, we can obtain other possibilities with uh, reaction products that we have done. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga, Pablo, Marivi, for this first session. And now it's time to speak about the innovative technologies that we have uh, researched and developed within the IRODI project. Please, Inga, Melanie, Boyan, we invite you to, to the table. Inga, you can come here directly, I think. Inga Grigaliunaite, sorry. <laughs> From Feyecom in the Netherlands is going to speak about the supercritical carbon dioxide applications for bio-based products. Inga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming. So I am Inga Grigalunite. I have been working in Feyecom development and implementation for almost 12 years using working on supercritical carbon dioxide technologies. Today I'm here <clears throat> to show what we have done on Erode on concentrating minor compounds with a specific interest to squalene. And I hope that the information you find here today will trigger your interest to investigate technology further and maybe you come up with new ideas where you can apply it in your area. So how many of you know what is supercritical carbon dioxide? Oh, basically. <laughs> very good, very good. So for those who doesn't know, uh, supercritical carbon dioxide is a gas about its critical point. It has both liquid and gas properties. It has increased diffusivities and uh, decreased viscosities that is favorable for many processes. It has zero surface tension as well. History of supercritical carbon dioxide goes to nine, 19th century and first industrial implementation started in 80s where the caffeination of coffee and tea we started as well as hop extractions for beer productions and of course spices extraction. So Piacon DNA. Uh, Piacon is small medium enterprise uh, established in the Netherlands in 1992 by Hert Fire who had uh, did his PhD thesis on supercritical carbon dioxide fractionation. During that time, uh, we have implemented uh, 10 processes uh, at industrial scale. So yeah, a few examples of them. Uh, supercritical carbon dioxide extraction of hemp, core cleaning, or extraction of cork, fat powder production or fat micronization, in the tissue processing, uh, textile dry cleaning, changing toxic solvents to supercritical carbon dioxide and textile dyeing. Uh, an example, maybe not related with biomass, but with tissues, uh, when you have a cancer and you, if the autopsy needs to be taken, uh, the surgeon takes a small piece and then it needs to be observed in the microscope. It's not so straightforward. You have to prepare the sample. First, you have to remove all fats that are in the tissue. You need to impregnate with paraffin, slice in tiny, tiny sl slices and put under a microscope that you'll be able to see what sort of cells are there. So conventional technique uses organic solvents to do that. So we replaced organic solvents with supercritical carbon dioxide. Uh, it has been implemented and then it's the equipment has uh, have been installed in some hospitals in the Netherlands and uh, they have been successfully working with it. But it's to introduce new technology to the market, it's not so easy and it's not so straightforward. It's, uh, it's difficult to get people's 
perception that people accept because people don't like changes. <laughs> they like the things they know the best <laughs> and go stick with that. So supercritical carbon dioxide fractionation, it's a very simple process. <laughs> it can, you can compare simply with distillation process. The main difference is that in distillation, you use boiling points and you boil the material to evaporate. In supercritical carbon dioxide, you dissolve the material in CO2 gas simply. The process is conducted at low temperatures compared to short to distillation process. It's in a range of 35 to 90 degrees. It is selective, it is flexible and cost competitive. <laughs> Uh, usually people have different ideas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, that is expensive and they don't even look at the process. It's not true. It's, uh, it can be cost competitive. You just look, you have to look case by case and product by product. So in Erode, our focus was squalene separation from DOD with the goal to produce a fraction with a squalene concentration higher than 80%. I can tell you that we did it. Uh, we produced squalene concentration with a purity of 95%. Sure, the road for that, it's not easy and straightforward as in any of the processes is not. <laughs> there are many details that you have to know and you have to discover along the way to make it successful. So there are two approaches that you can go to there. You, have, you can go direct fractionation, direct DOD fractionation, and you can have a pretreatment step in between that makes your life easier and simpler for further processing. So with direct uh, direct fractionation, we produce fraction 24% school impurity. And with two step, we could go to 43 and then to 95. Uh, please make uh, sure that I'm not saying that you cannot produce uh, higher concentrated school fraction with direct fractionation, but it all comes to economics you wouldn't like uh, to pay significant amount of money for the production of uh, the fraction. Although if you can sell for higher price, maybe, <laughs> who knows? So <clears throat> supercritical carbon fractionation can be applied uh, not only for DODs, possible applications, fish oil, different seed oil, she butter, flax oil, uh, you name it, milk fat, coconut oil, oil, palm oil, oil residual streams, DOD, as we did for erodic projects. So the process is at low temperature and some pictures, uh, as we did many experiments with different uh, spoolene starting concentrations, initial spoolene starting concentrations. So uh, low, medium and high, you see, you can see what the different fractions look like, and coconut oil fractionation and palm oil fractionation. Uh, supercritical carbon dioxide versus distillation. I would like to stretch that the process is cost competitive, uh, as uh, there is idea in people's heads that this is expensive. But I can tell you what, there is no tea process. Then you have to produce, all processes are expensive. You use energy everywhere. Is it true or is it not? <laughs> it is true. <laughs> so process can be both CAPEX and OPEX cost competitive. The best as a technology, one technology does not fit all as the size, one size does not fit all, all. so, Distillation, short part distillation, CO2, all of them are great technologies if you use them at particular places, at uh, product and process specific places. If you can com combine technologies, you would achieve great result. We estimate that a single CO2 fractionation step 
could be equivalent to three disrelation steps. And I would like to stretch that the process is done at low temperatures. So it's the product, produced product is not affected by high temperatures. So it's superior product, not degraded during your processing. If you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them to you after other three presentations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Melanie Fletcher from the Institute of Stan Hopper is going to speak about the process development for cooking products using antimatic mitigations. Welcome also from my side. Um, my name is Melanie Platzer, and I'm working at um, as she already said, at the Fraunhofer Institute for Process Engineering and Packaging at the Department of um, Process Development for Raw Materials. So before I start, I will give you a short overview over my presentation. I will start with the motivation. So why do we work for um, technical applications and which um, technical applications we use? Then I will give you an overview over um, enzymatic modification processes for vegetable oils, the transesterification and the esterification method. And I will also show you some results of the modified oils. And at the end, we have time for some questions. So why do we work uh, with technical applications, especially with lubricants? Because it's we have a big uh, market share of about, we produce about a, a about 35 million tons lubricants per year. And the problem is that these lubricants are mainly based on mineral oil. Um, both uh, the base oil for the lubricants as well as the additives you need for the spe um, specific, specific lubricant properties. And that's a problem because you have a very high, uh, a very expensive disposal. You have um, the, the lubricants are hazardous to health and of course they are environmental harmful. So this is a big problem because about 10 million tons per year get into the environment. So that's the reason why bio-based bio lubricants are growing and at the moment we have a total market share of about 5%. And these bio-based lubricants are mostly based on vegetable oils. Vegetable oils have some positive effects as for example, the sustainability, you have a bit good biodegradability and of course a good lubricity, but there are also some negative aspect, aspects because vegetable oils are mostly used for the food industry. So we have high costs and of course we always have the plate or tank discussion, um, but we also have um, poor oxidation and temperature, st temperature stability of the vegetable oils because we have many unsaturated free fatty acids. Um, and in order to solve these problems, we can use um, mod different types of modification. Of course, you can do chemical mod modifications, but you also can do enzymatically modifications, which bring some advantages. Um, you have a very high selectivity, so you can um, do a target modification. You um, get uh, you have an influence of the composition of the oil you get at the end and you only have to use mild reaction conditions. So you can do the reaction at low temperatures and pH values. And of course, these processes are very environmentally friendly. So you don't have to use any um, strong acids or other chemicals. And two different types of modifications I'm gonna talk about is the transesterification and the esterification. So. First, I will start with the transesterification of vegetable oils. Here on the right side, you can see the reaction of partial transesterification with ethanol, and um, you use lipases for this process. So main, um, vegetable oils mainly um, contain of triglycerides, and by using lipases, you can cleave them into a mixture of monod and triglycerides. And of course, free fatty acids, which react with the ethanol to um, the acid acryl esters. So you can do this partial, partial transesterification to modify your oil. Um, of course, depending on the application you 
will have at the end. So you can influence the lubricating effect. It will, will get better depending on the composition. And of course, uh, the emulsifying effect. And you also can do an adjustment of the viscosity, which also depends on the application. For example, if you um, have in the end a lubricant for chainsaw, you need a, a higher viscosity. So in the end, you can produce a cost-optimized base fluid for lubricants, because if the lubricant has better lubricant properties, um, less additives are needed, so it can save um, costs. The second modification step is the esterification, um, which also was a big part of the IRODI project. Um, here we used it for neutralization of the free fatty acids. You can see it here on the right side. And again, we use lipases. Um, of course, you can here use also the glycerol as, yeah, for example, the side stream from the biodiesel production. Um, and in the, in the end, you will get a mixture of monod and triglycerides. So this could be an alternative process for the conventional um, neutralization process you have uh, during the oil refining process. And you will have uh, lower disposal costs if you do it um, in the enzymatic way. And what is another advantage is you can use some side stream or residual materials, for example, the deodorizer destillates, which contains um, which have a high content of free fatty acids um, in order to produce, yeah, for example, base media for lubricants. And again, you, have, um, you can influence the properties of the lubricants. You have an effect on the lubricating effect. You can adjust, again, the viscosity, and so you can produce a cost-optimized base fluid. Um, but there are other ways of esterification processes. For example, you can also do esterification of the free fatty acids by using different types of secondary plant metabolites. For example, polyphenols. You can see here an example. You have here the quercetin glucoside and it reacts with the free fatty acids. So in the end, you get a polyphenol, which is more soluble in oil applications. That's just an example. You can also use other um, secondary plant metabolites, for example, glucosinolates and so on. So again, you can influence the properties of the lubricant. You, have, you can, for example, increase the oxidation stability if you use polyphenols or the wear or corrosion resistance if you use glucosinolates or other secondary plant metabolites. And again, you can reduce the use of additives um, in the lubricant system. So at the end, I'm going to show you some um, results of modified and not modified vegetable oils. In the first um, figure, you can see the friction coefficient of two different oils. We have um, the not modified oil and the modified oil. And as you can see, we can reduce the friction um, by modification of, of the vegetable oils. And we can also um, influence the oxidation stability. You can hear, see it here as oxidation induction time. Um, a high oxidation induction time means a high um, oxidation stability. So as you can see, we, our modified oil has a higher oxidation um, stability than the not modified oil. And as I already said, you also have an influence on the viscosity, um, which depends, of course, on the application. We can modify it. So we have a higher viscosity, but we also can do modifications to get a lower viscosity. So by using different types of enzymatic modifications, for example, the transesterification and the esterification, we can produce completely bio-based lubricant systems with a reduced need of additives. So now I'm at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. To finish this uh, session on innovative technologies, we have Dr. Boyan Liev from Iolitech, Germany. He's going to speak about ionic liquids for destruction of compounds from biomass. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll say a few words about what we did within the projects and of course, some other possible application of uh, our products. So uh, I'll start with a short introduction, basically what ionic liquids are, uh, what you can do with them, uh, except buy them from us, which is of course the main reason of us producing them. 
some words about extraction from the oleoriser distillates, uh, extraction from biomass, uh, some words about recycling, which we're trying, of course, uh, to do uh, because of the costs and, of course, of uh, general, let's say, ecological meaning of the whole process. Short summary and outlook, and then, of course, I'll be glad to answer your questions. What are ionic liquids? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, but this is a class of compounds which consists entirely of ions. So you can imagine something like sodium chloride, but uh, due to the fact that we have strongly asymmetrical cations and also some weird anions with highly depolarized charges, uh, we have compounds which are completely ionic, but nevertheless, they are liquid at room temperature or even below. What you can do with that sort of uh, funny things, you can do quite a, quite a lot. Um, the interesting thing here is that you have, let's say, a series of interesting properties, including that those are liquid or a very wide temperature range, above 100 degrees usually. They have a very good thermal stability going up to, let's say, 300, 400 degrees centigrade. Electrochemical stability up to six volts. Low vapor pressure, which means they're non-volatile, which means in most cases they're not flammable. And of course, since they are ionic, they have an electric conductivity. What was important for us in this project was the last property, the tunable miscibility, because this allows extraction of different compounds out of complicated matrices. So uh, what I'll talk to you about mainly is this part here, the solution of biomass and extraction out of it. But you can see there are zillions of possible applications. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have the time to uh, go through those. I can spend the whole 10 minutes on that slide only, but uh, well, I hope uh, uh, you'll come back with some questions to me afterwards and we can discuss it further. Anyway, uh, extraction from the other eyes, Deslace is was one of our parts in this project. What we started with was direct top throw extraction. As you can see in some of the cases here, we do obtain a good phase separation. In some cases, of course, we do not. You can see it somewhat better here. You can see here we have a phase separation, here we not. But the problem is, although we see uh, a decreasing concentration of the tocopherol in the organic phase, we are not able to find this tocopherol in the ionic liquid phase. There are speculations if that's because of degradation or if because we're not able to extract it back out of the ionic liquid because a direct determination in the ionic liquid is unfortunately not possible. We have uh, varied multiple combinations of cations and so on and so forth, but uh, the problem actually remains that direct extraction uh, of tocopherol out uh, of the DODs with those ionic liquids is unfortunately not possible. What you can do, though, is the indirect tocopherol extraction. As you saw in the previous case, there was uh, a remark that the DOD from which the schooling was extracted up to 95% was pretreated. And this is, this is the catch. If you pretreat uh, your DOD with, let's say, a base, ionic liquid base, then you generate a free, well, a fatty acid salt. You can also hydrolyze, monoglycerize, deglycerize if you have other components in there. And then you can extract very nicely with supercritical CO2 or with, in this case, organic solvents. And then you can really nicely and successfully extract uh, your value added components out of your DOD. So uh, moving to another part of the talk, uh, I know some of you will not agree that uh, olive oil is not the most important biomass in the world, mm -hmm. but there are some other uh, sources of biomass, such as, let's say, cellulose. It is not very well soluble in most of, let's say, the organic solvents used. The best you can get is about 15% in NMO, which is not really a lot. I only think we actually can do much better. If you take a look here, this is the concentration that you can get of cellulose in your ionic liquid. This is the temperature. And in some cases, we can actually go to up to 37%. This is quite a lot. And this gives you, well, somewhat slurry solutions. They're not like free flowing. Uh, they're usually highly viscous, but they are homogeneous. You can actually work very, very nicely with them. As you know, probably, uh, let's say biomass or let's say trees are not composed only of cellulose. There are three main components, namely cellulose, lignin, and starch. 
I will not go through all the details, uh, but what is really nice, as you can see, we have quite a few cases where for a single compound, for example, for this one, you have high solubility for one of the components, or let's say partial solubility for the second one, and it's not soluble in the third one. And again, here, which means you have a solvent which allows you to separate all three components, a single solvent, which is actually a uh, Pretty nice. That gives you, of course, the possibility to go to the, let's say, concept of biorefinery, where you have your biomass, you pre-treat it or treat it with ionic liquids, and then you can do all sorts of things inside, starting from separating the components onto reactions like processing, cracking. Well, we show that extraction is possible, and you can go to all sorts of other chemicals like fuels or sugars or, well, what I'll show you again here is fibers. Going on to recycling, of course, it's very important. Uh, I guess the question will come up, ionic liquids are very expensive. So recycling is a major point, not only from an environmental point of view, but also from a financial one. We have developed a project, well, uh, well it's part of a project, but it's actually a process where you can get cellulose together with an ionic liquid. You get a spinning solution and out of so-called wet spinning, you can really get very nice, very strong, very high performance cellulose fibers out of it. The question is, what happens with the ionic liquid? You can actually recycle it. And we were able to achieve up to 99% plus recovery. Well, I didn't want to write 100 because that's you know, not very nice. But this is what you start from. This is after about 100 spinning processes. You can see this is where you start from going darker and darker with every spinning process further. But after about 100 spinning processes, this is the color you get. And after you regenerate it, you end up with, well, it depends how much effort you spend, but this one or that one. So this is what it looks like on the UV. But it's a relatively simple process, and it allows you a very good, very efficient, and almost quantitative recovery of your ionic liquid. So uh, in order not to waste any more time, uh, I guess this is a question which will come up anyways. So might as well uh, start with it now. Uh, prices of ionic liquids. Uh, you can see these are nanomaterials, which well, can range from 10 euros per kilo for the most common one to like 10,000. Gold and platinum. I mean, here we're talking about cheating, so that's not really something we want to do. And going down to really cheap things like bauxite and mineral oil. I mean, ionic liquids are somewhere in the middle. I mean, I I'm not going to lie to you. They're never going to be as cheap as those they're never going to be as cheap as let's say hexane or toluene or, or astone but we have in the meantime uh, compounds which can sell on a large industrial scale for the range of let's 50 euros per kg this is something you couldn't even dream of 10 years ago so imagine what will happen within the next 10 years and uh, to shortly summarize also the results uh, we were able to show that uh, value-added components extraction uh, from deodorized distillate is not really economically viable. Uh, I would here have to emphasize direct extraction. But after neutralizing with, uh, let's say, ionic liquid basis, further extraction with other methods is uh, possible. And it is, as we saw earlier, very efficient. You can also dissolve quite a lot of biomass into ionic liquids. Then you can do fibers from them. You can do basically whatever you want. And this is the main uh, strength of this technology. You can also separate biomass into its uh, different components. So uh, this was briefly from me. I would love to answer your questions and thank you very much for your attention. No questions. Perfect, thank you very much. Yes, we are going to open a, a questions and answer time. So are there any questions for Inga, Melanie, Boyan? Yes, right here, the microphone. Yeah, we do the fractionation of biomass with steam. Mm -hmm. So, and we get our lignin cellulose, hemicellulose. 
But if I go further with your system, ionic liquids, so can I extract uh, higher, with higher concentrations? I'm thinking to have like the two processes, first with steam and later your ionic liquid system. Generally, yes. The only restraint it is that usually in most cases, uh, you need the BAMAS to be relatively dry in order to achieve good separation. Uh, let's say below 5%. This is the only catch here. Otherwise, I don't see why not. I mean, we have enough examples where we can really show a very good selectivity of the ionic liquids towards one of the components of the biomass. So as long as you know what you have inside and what you want to extract, this shouldn't be a problem. But most probably, there needs to be a drying step in between. And the final question, do you prepare your ionic liquids or yeah. do you have a provider? No, we prepare them ourselves. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a question regarding the supercritical CO2 extraction. Is it possible to, um, in one, run separate free fatty acids from triacylglycerol or the fatty acids in a oil? Would you like to separate fatty acids? Free from fatty acids. Free fatty acids. You can separate free fatty acids from triglycerides. Okay, with the supercritical CO2. Yes. Because we use it to extract the oil from a substrate and we get a combination of both the normal like linoleic acid, uh, oleic acid, plus the free fatty acids in a 5% yeah. concentration. And so it, my question was, if it was possible to optimize the supercritical CO2 conditions to get two fractions in, in one run. You can, you, you get two fractions, top fraction and the bottom fraction. Sorry? You get two fractions, top fractions and the bottom fractions. It's like in distillation, okay. distillate and raffinate. So you can easily separate free fat acids from triglycerides. It is uh, actually it's one of the applications possible advantageous applications for CO2. It would be very easy to separate them. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Comments? My question is on uh, the supercritical CO2. I'm not quite familiar with it. Um, how do you source for the liquid um, CO2? Do you sequester from the environment or the atmosphere? And how do you refine to get pure CO2 that you use um, the technology? I just want you to enlighten me a bit on it. Thank you. Uh, we are buying. CO2 for the processes, but in general, CO2 is produced by a gas. Gas companies that compresses the gas, they're producing CO2. But of course, maybe you can uh, you can combine the technologies, but I, I'm not sure if it would make sense. Uh, for the process, CO2 is recycled. You don't do completely. Perfect. I think there are not any other questions either in the in the audience really either, right? So I think it's not. So it's time for a break to you can go around, go to the toilet, you can go downstairs to to take a coffee. There are coffee tables in the main hall of, of the conference downstairs. And we will be back at 11:20. Okay. So we have. 50 minutes. Thank you.
Irodi is an ambitious research initiative funded by the BBI, now CBE, where 11 partners 
both from industrial profile and also research institutes work together in the development of an industrial process based on my economy and circular economy. In particular, we work with the deorization distillates, which are subproducts of the vegetable oil refining processes. We work in new green technologies for extraction of mineral valuable components present in the deorization distillates. In Irodi, we have obtained natural surfactants, biodegradable biolubricants, and biopolyols, which are going to be used in the formulation of bio based adhesives. Biomass is key in the transition towards a net zero emission scenario. We need to move away from the use of fossil fuels for energy, but also for materials. Bioproducts have a bright future. The demand is growing, driven by government's net zero target and increasingly environmentally conscious customers, which demand sustainable solutions from companies. Cleaner we have replaced in some commercial detergent formulations the petroleum-based surfactants with the surfactant Irodi. And the best results have been obtained in cleaning and degreasing of hard surfaces. We are interested in using these alternative products in our cleaners because using bio-based raw materials such as aerodic surfactants helps us to improve the environmental impact of our products and reduce emissions. We also make use of material walls by putting them in new uses. This is our contribution to bioeconomy and circular economy. As a chemical manufacturers, we are well aware of our responsibility with the environment. Sustainability is in cleaner DNA. Participating in Irodic project has been a very enriching experience and considering the very positive result that we have achieved encourage us to participate in more projects in the future. Bioeconomy means using renewable biological resources from crops, forests, animals, microorganisms, waste to produce food, energy, biofuels and bio-based materials. Stronger development of the bioeconomy will help the European Union accelerate progress towards a circular and low-carbon economy. It will help modernize and strengthen the European industrial base, creating new value chains and greener, more cost-efficient industrial processes while protecting biodiversity and the environment. Irodi project clearly illustrates how an industrial bioeconomy model can successfully work.
Irodi is an ambitious research initiative funded by the Irodi is an ambitious research initiative funded by the BBI, now CBE, where 11 partners, both from industrial profile and also research institutes, work together in the development of an industrial process based on my economy and circular economy. In particular, we work with the deorization distillates, which are subproducts of the vegetable oil refining processes. We work in new green technologies for extraction of mineral valuable components present in the deorization distillates. In Irodi, we have obtained natural surfactants, biodegradable biolubricants, and biopolyols, which are going to be used in the formulation of bio based adhesives. Biomass is key in the transition towards a net zero emission scenario. We need to move away from the use of fossil fuels for energy, but also for materials. Bioproducts have a bright future. The demand is growing, driven by government's net zero target, and increasingly environmentally conscious customers, which demand sustainable solutions from companies. Cleaner we have replaced in some commercial detergent formulations the petroleum-based surfactants with the surfactant Irodi. And the best results have been obtained in cleaning and degreasing of hard surfaces. We are interested in using these alternative products in our cleaners because using bio-based raw materials such as aerodic surfactants helps us to improve the environmental impact of our products and reduce emissions. 
we also make use of material walls by putting them in new uses. This is our contribution to bioeconomy and circular economy. As a chemical manufacturers, we are well aware of our responsibility with the environment. Sustainability is in cleaner DNA. Participating in erotic projects has been a very enriching experience and considering the very positive result that we have achieved encourage us to participate in more projects in the future. By economy means using renewable biological resources from crops, forests, animals, microorganisms, ways to produce food, energy, biofuels and bio-based materials. Stronger development of the bioeconomy will help the European Union accelerate progress towards a circular and low-carbon economy. It will help modernize and strengthen the European industrial base, creating new value chains and greener, more cost-efficient industrial processes while protecting biodiversity and the environment. Irodi project clearly illustrates how an industrial bioeconomy model can successfully work. And after reviewing the feedstock and the innovative technology that can be used to valorize these byproducts from the vegetable oil refining and, and, and transform them into sustainable bio-based products, now we are going to go to the industry side. We are going to, to, to know more about why industries are interested in this biomolecules in this in producing these bioproducts in combining their traditional products with these new sustainable products why industries are interested in in promoting as well biocircularity in their processes and for that we have Susana Rate from, from Cleaner Professional, Romain Rodriguez from Sofin and uh, Harmut Henneken from Jowat. So in this session, uh, industries, is, they are going to, to share their, their views on, and their experience in Irodi project as well. So Susana, the floor is, is yours. She's going to speak about bio-based surfactants for detergency. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning. I am Susana Rate from Cleaner Professional, and I am going to talk about bio-based surfactants for detergency. Uh, in particular, who we are, our interest in bio-based surfactants, and our role in Nirodi. Well, we are a Spanish firm which manufactures chemical products for industrial and professional maintenance and cleaning. Uh, as a, a manufacturer of chemical products, we are well aware of our responsibility with uh, to env environment and human health. Uh, and we are certified with uh, quality and environmental system systems. Uh, we have nine products registered with a European Ecolabel and eight products with uh, NSF reg uh, register. Well, uh, where our factory is located in the north of Spain, where we have two labs, the chemical lab and the microbiological uh, lab, sorry. In the chemical lab, uh, we design and develop the chemical, the chemical product, the chemical uh, business product, and here is where we have uh, work uh, in the Irodi, in the Irodi project. In the other lab, in the biote biotechnological lab, we develop uh, bio biotechnological products for biodegradation of hydrocarbons, for example, in, in separators. Well, uh, here uh, you can see the field of applications of, our, uh, of the product that we manufacture. For example, for in automotion, we make uh, 
uh, car or track cleaning products. For industry, we make a research, cutting, uh, cutting oils. The 14,000 DCO and uh, biotech are the business linked to biotechnology. We make a, a what is the business uh, linked to hostelry. And uh, we also make uh, disinfectants and detergents for food industry. Um, and the global business involves all the products that can be used in any, in any sector, such as uh, floor cleaning products or water, treat, uh, water treatment products. And to explain our interest in biobased products, we, it's necessary to explain the composition of a detergent. A detergent may be composed of many components, depending on the surface to be cleaned, the type of dirt, the cleaning method, or, or the temperature. But the, but the surfactants are always there. The surfactants are the... Um, the role of a surfactant in the in a detergent is to be the the uh, the wetting, foaming, or or anti or anti foaming detergent dispersing uh, agent, and uh, 20, uh, 20 million tons of surfactants are produced uh, per year. Half of the of the surfactants have. Uh, has pet are, are sorry petroleum derived, so they are they this source is not uh, renewable. They have uh, lower bi uh, biodegradability and higher and uh, higher ecotoxicity, ecotoxicity, and the other half are plant derived, so they can cause deforestation, loss of the of the of the uh, biodiversity, and they have a big impact on wildlife. On the other hand, are the biobased surfactants, such as uh, erodic surfactant. Uh, erodic surfactant, his uh, origin is a waste, uh, is a waste material, is not irrit irritant to skin, and in 20, 28 days, it is fully biodegradable. So uh, if we can calculate uh, the life cycle of a detergent, uh, it will be very, well, it uh, using uh, aerodic surfactant will improve the life of cycle of a, of a detergent, and it will be very uh, very useful to eco-design the, the products, well, uh, the detergents in our case. Uh, moreover, we have calculated the carbon uh, fingerprint of our organizations, so using uh, aerodic surfactant, we, we will reduce it. In addition to design ecolabel products, the, the use of uh, erodic surfactant is very, is very interesting because it is not only an eco-friendly surfactant, but also, but also a very efficient, uh, efficient product. And uh, to design ecolabel products, we need, uh, we need both eco-friendly and efficiency. And uh, uh, about our role in, in erodi, we have uh, participating in five work packages in, uh, and where our participation has been more important in work, work package two and work package uh, five. In work package two, uh, together with Technalia, we have worked uh, in the characterization of the surfactant obtained by, by uh, free fatty acids neutralization with ionic liquids. And uh, we have selected selected the the best one. And uh, in work package uh, five, we have the we have replaced it in some uh, detergent formulations the conventional surfactants with the uh, with the selected uh, erodi, erodi surfactant. And uh, we have uh, used the this new surfactant in a laundry detergent in an ecolabel detergent for has for hard surface cleaning in a ready-to-use multipurpose detergent and in a concentrated detergent for floor washing machine. And uh, uh, the best results have been obtained uh, for hard surface cleaning. And in the case of the concentrated detergent for floor washing machine, the, the, the results have, uh, have been amazing, even better than with the original formulation. And the original formulation, it's really a good uh, product. So uh, in conclusion, we can affirm that the erodic surfactant is uh, a sustainable uh, surfactant 
and uh, also a very a very high performing surfactant. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Susana. Now it's time to speak about Esqualen for the cosmetic industry from Romain Rodriguez Sofim. Hello, thank you everyone uh, to joining us for this uh, very interesting project. Uh, so, um, I'm uh, Roman Rodriguez, I'm uh, R&D manager for Sofim. And uh, Sofim is a leader of um, squalan, vegetable squalan and squalin in the world. We make about uh, 600 tons per year. So uh, this project we, is very important for us to, to see other technologies, which can be interesting for us, of course. And uh, our role was to evaluate squalene and squalan coming from the SCO2 extract uh, from Fayocon. So I will talk a little bit about squalene and squalan, the traditional process. And then we will talk about the evaluation of this squalene coming from SCO2 extract. And then question if, if you have. So squalene, it's a natural tree type annoid. It's ubiquitous in the living world, means you find it in every organism. It's contained about 10 and 15% in the cell. That's why it's a really interesting molecule for cosmetic application. The problem is it's sensitive to oxidation and photooxidation due to the presence of six double bonds. So as cosmetic is the major market, we transform the squalene into squalene, which is fully saturated and stable to hair and uh, to oxidation. But you can find also squalene in pharmaceutical application and nutraceutical, but it's not the point today. As raw material source, you have the animal source. This is the historic source. But in 20 years ago, mainly, uh, with the overfishing uh, of, um, of shark in the seas, cosmetic industries prefer to go to vegetable source. Squalene. And you have two kinds of source for, veg for vegetable. You have DOD. Squalene is present between 1 and 10% in DOD. We make extraction, separation, transformation, classical chemical transformation to have squalene. And then by hydrogenation, you have squalene. But 10 years ago, uh, you have synthetic biology, which make fermentation of sugarcane to make furnace in, and then with dimerization and hydrogenation, you can have squalane. But today, as we will talk about DOD, <laughs> I will focus on this part. The traditional process with uh, DOD is mainly composed by transformation of saponifable compounds, FFA, glycerides, methyl esters, ethyl esters, and then separation extraction steps. The classical industrial manufacturing is chemical esterification or chemical transesterification, and the separation extraction steps is distillation, crystallization, and chromatography. And in our project, so as we have seen, enzymatic esterification has been made by Fraunhofer. SCO2 extract was made by Fayocon, and this extract was sent to Sofim to evaluate it. So nice photos about uh, Sofim. Yeah? <laughs> Big uh, fractionation column. Okay, so for the transformation of squalene into squalene, you have more or less four steps. 
you have saponification in order to have an hundred percent of insaponifiable matter. Then you have hydrogenation to stabilize squalene into squalene and winterization to remove um, paraffin, natural paraffin contained in uh, insaponifiable matter. And uh, last uh, step of the coloration to, to get a noily product uh, completely clear and uncolored. This, the experiment was made uh, be, between 200 milliliters to one liter experiment. Here you use some photos of our two liter reactors of saponification, fully automatized uh, autoclave reactor, uh, two liter. Here it's the winterization. So we go to from 30 degrees to minus 10 degrees. And then classical percolation over silica gel. So this is some photos about the product. So you see after saponification, you have squalene, which is a little bit yellow due to some vitamin E and some other products. After hydrogenation, you have um, a, a, how to say um, product with a little bit of solid inside. This is a paraffin. So after winterization, you have your final product, just a decoloration, and you have the squalene cosmetic grains. So four concentrates were evaluated with the entire process. Overall yield between 40 and 80%, depending the concentration, the initial concentration, versus 95 at industrial scale. But it's really interesting to see that we can reach without further optimization, 80%, which is really interesting. And the, the most important is that final squalene products meets SOFIM specification for squalene uh, in uh, for co cosmetic use. So if you have any question, I will be happy to respond. Thank you. So we can use these uh, byproducts from the production of vegetable oils for detergents, for cosmetics, and as well for adhesives. Dr. Harmut Henneken from Jowat is going to speak about this right now. Thank you very much. Dr. Yes, thank you. Just to figure out to, yes. Um, yeah, adhesive. So that is uh, something usually at conferences like this, people do not know too much about. It's uh, maybe a few words. I don't have slides on that, but a few words. Adhesives in general are basically polymers. So it's uh, all kind of uh, polymers. So we just need the chain lengths to, to build the cohesive strengths. So the adhesives need to hold things together. And we need, in, in order to, to transfer the strengths to the substrates, we need a good wetting. So we can have adhesives that are dispersions, water-based or uh, solvent-based, dispersions. So the wetting is from the solvent, which can be water, which is evaporating, there's film formation, and then you have the polymers that transfer the strength. All the wetting can be by melting polymers. Uh, plastics, basically adhesives, hot melt adhesives are plastics. You're doing, you're melting them. The molten phase is for the wetting, and then you have the crystallization to get first initial strength, and uh, later up you have maybe some chemistry, cross-linking to build up uh, further cohesion. Uh, and Jovat is a company, we are actually not known to the general public because we're delivering only to the industry. Uh, we are among the top five adhesive manufacturers globally, actually, but the, the other three or four above us are much, much bigger. We are a family-driven company, uh, founded in 1919, 104 years old now. The headquarters is in the middle center of Germany in Detmold, small city, 70,000 people living there. And uh, we are producing actually everywhere over. The, so in, in the US for the Americas, in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur for Asia Pacific, 
and in Germany and Switzerland, uh, but mostly in Germany uh, for uh, yeah, Europe and Africa. And uh, myself, I'm uh, head of research, uh, global research for, for Jovat. And uh, I'm also then uh, responsible for such projects like this. And we, are, we really want to uh, go towards the sustainable future. So we want to, actually we have in 1919, we were 100% bio-based. When we were started, uh, it was all protein-based adhesives. And uh, then chemical synthesis was coming up, uh, polyvinyl acetate, things like that. And so we were changing towards a completely fossil-based chemistry, almost completely. So, so some at the moment we have about five to 10% bio-based share. We're producing 100,000 tons a year, about a little more uh, adhesives and uh, below 10% is bio-based so far. And we need to go uh, to 100% in the next 35 years, bio-based or recycling-based. So we don't want to use fresh carbon, fresh fossil carbon uh, from earth. So that's our motivation basically. And we strongly rely it's basically the only way we, we need to buy raw materials from the market. So we cannot make our own raw materials. So if we cannot get bio-based materials, we cannot use them. So, and that's also why we are engaged in such projects to, yeah, to, to uh, trigger the possibility to show what end uses, what possible end uses there are. So this is our motivation. And here I'm just showing one technology, the background about one technology, which we're using here for Arodi, so we're talking about polyurethane adhesives. That is the chemistry. Yes, that's the chemistry behind. Simplified here just as a diol, not a polyol. And what we are doing in, in manufacture, so we, this, these are all raw materials we're using and we are producing uh, pre-polymers. And these pre-polymers are basically, together with other raw materials I'm showing on the next slide, are basically the adhesive in that case. And uh, pre-polymer because uh, the end user is applying the adhesive and then the cross-linking is taking place with humidity. So we need the free isocyanate, uh, which is reacting with humidity, yielding then uh, polyurea bonds to build up the cohesive strengths. And there is also important, you see here, picture of uh, a lot of other raw materials going in there. Uh, but the most important ones are the isocytes and the polyols. Everything else is mixing, but this is really chemistry, which is doing in the product, done in the production of adhesives and also then happening at the customer. And that's very important. Uh, we have two uh, polyurethane, yeah, two, two technologies of adhesives where polyurethane adhesives uh, are used. It's one, it's a so-called pre-polymer room temperature curing liquid adhesives, 100% system, so no, no uh, solvent in there, no water in there. And the other one is hot melt polyurethanes, which means the one is liquid raw materials and the hot melts are solid raw materials and are molten at higher temperatures, usually 130 to 140 degrees. And for the hot melts, it is extremely difficult compared to the other ones to use uh, natural raw materials, bio-based raw materials, because we strongly need a, a functionality, OH functionality of 2.0. Because if we are really, uh, uh, if, if we are using the polyols, uh, we need to make cross, uh, chain extension, long chain, and not too much cross-linking because the customer still needs to be able to melt it. So if it's too much cross-linked, then, the, then it's, uh, it cannot be used as adhesive anymore. And that's also the reason why in, in, in this project, we focus basically on the pre-polymer systems because the functionality is not that important anymore. And here, see some, some uh, results. Actually, the, the data is not so important. I mean, uh, you see number 15 here. So we had 10 others before that, that didn't work that much. There was a clear improvement. So the green was increasing much more towards the end of the project. What we're doing here, we were testing, uh, that is a reference here. For us, viscosity is a very important measure because the viscosity shows us uh, how much cross-linking has been done and, and viscosity also after uh, a storage nine days at elevated temperatures of 50 degrees uh, because that resembles then storage at a customer. So we want to have at least six months 
stability at the customer without crosslink happen happening because crosslinking will be induced by water. Water vapor is everywhere, so we have to seal it with aluminum bags. But still, uh, more than five or six months is, is, is really difficult as shelf life. And you can see here that was the, the aerotic polymers. Well, in green mark, the, the values we got, the stability, the, the reactivity towards isocyanides was uh, very promising. So we really think that the polyols will be able to be used as, uh, as, as polymers, as, as raw materials for our polyurethane polymers. And the outlook, what we're doing now at the moment, uh, Technalia is providing us with uh, a little larger amount of these uh, polyols. So they are based on glycerol reacted with free fatty acids or uh, pentaerythritol, which is uh, four uh, functionality of four OH, uh, um, also reacted with the free fatty acids. And uh, we are quite positive from the previous results that we can get adhesives from that that are working. We do not know yet for what applications because that is really uh, can never be predicted uh, because it's so many influences and happening. Uh, you need to uh, have good adherence to different surfaces and that can be very small changes in, in the recipe, in the formulation can make very big effects. So we will see at what applications we're going in, in everything actually. It could be automotive, could be furniture, could be book binding. Uh, so basically we will see where, but we, are, we know from the properties of the raw materials that it should be possible to use them. So if there's any questions, I think uh, we have now the question sessions for all three of us. And here you see uh, uh, my contact data. If you have any uh, questions about the company, you can just look uh, www.jovat.com and you find everything or jovat.de. And I'm on the table for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susanna, Romain, Harmut. Are there any questions for these industrial representatives? Not online? Yes, on site? Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, it's interesting to have the questions at the end because I have questions for all of you. <laughs> so uh, I'll start. Yeah. With... That's, that's one way to get your attention. Uh, so I'm very interested in, in all of these uh, approaches. Uh, let's, let's just start at the top. Um, when we're talking uh, about cleaning products, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, have you considered production of um, uh, biological uh, uh, cleaners such as uh, enzymes or, um, no. or other materials from, from these materials? Because uh, that's another alternative right well the, we, we don't well, we work with enzymes but uh, we use them just to is they are just an ingredient of our products in some products but we just uh, when we talk about microbiological uh, uh, cleaning products they are just uh, bacteria mm -hmm, mm -hmm. bacteria that, that we use to biodegrade the hydrocarbon in separators uh, right. for example mm -hmm. but uh, they are not linked to it disinfectant there are two two different see, business see. yeah no because there are some organisms that will produce that when cultivated on yes. on these types of materials but it's very interesting um second question i guess for on squalene uh, and squalene. Uh, so squalene is an antioxidant, right? Uh, and, and you're converting it to squalene because it's more stable. Uh, but do you, do you lose that any antioxidant uh, capability when you convert from one to the other? Also, also on that, 
The thing yeah, is, so, people online, they yeah, yeah, the so microphone right. for yeah, that reason. Of course, right. we lose uh, all the acti antioxidant activity. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but does, uh, are there other um, uh, biofunctionalities for squalene? For, for squalene or squalene? For squalene, like your final Yeah, product. for squalene, but even if it's fully saturated and cannot play an antioxidant role, it still has the biomimetic. Uh, so that's why squal squalane and squalene penetrates very quickly in the, in the skin, yes, yeah. sorry, in the skin. And it's really interesting. And squalene, um, I think squalene will be interesting in the, in the few uh, years coming because it has a lot of activities uh, not known for the moment. We know the antioxidant activities. We know that is a precursor for uh, sterol and hormones. So it's really important in organism and other uh, biological uh, pro uh, properties like uh, injuries. Uh, it's, it interacts with uh, a lot of um, biological pathway. So it's a very interesting molecule. But for now, the market, it's cosmetic, and it's mainly squalane for that. It is a very interesting molecule. Thank you. Last question. Uh, with uh, polymers, uh, bio-based monomers, or feedstocks for production of your, of your, of your polymers, uh, have you considered um, uh, dicarboxylic acids as a potential uh, feedstock, like, for example, like succinic acid or... What, what are some good uh, biologically produced molecules that you would use? Yes, basically, you mentioned already, uh, I mean, any dye acid, I mean, there's, there's plenty of them available, also commercially available already. What we are using, we're not using the acids uh, by ourselves, but our suppliers. They are making polyester polyols from these acids, and uh, that are the ones we're using. So these are already contributing a little bit to the 10% I uh, mentioned before, we do have the problem, uh, we can provide a technology, we can pro offer to our customers, you can buy this for this price, for that, for that price, that is fossil and usually cheaper. <laughs> and uh, that is the problem. So we, uh, we would like to buy 100% bio based, uh, even if we would have it on our portfolio, uh, the customers still would not 100% buy it from us, because it's just uh, more expensive. And you know, the mass balance approach probably, which is, uh, the, I think, for, in my opinion, the most promising approach that suppliers like Covestro, BASF, uh, and others, uh, they can go in with the with bio nafta or recycling nafta and do the entire conventional process chain just with the bio feedstock to, to, uh, and use bio energy, of course, then to, to be fully sustainable or at least almost fully sustainable. That's uh, the most promising approach. But single molecules, as you mentioned, are very important. One which has always been used actually is, is a resin from pine trees, uh, colophonium. Uh, esters, uh, penta erythritol esters are made from colophonium, which could be 100% bio -based. These are used actually, these contribute a lot to the 10% I, because that has always been the case, but it's not been promoted uh, uh, yeah, the, the recent years. Now, as it's getting important, we say, okay, we can talk about what we're already doing all the time as well. But uh, any, any any acids, dye acids that are very important. Many are talking about lignin for adhesives. Lignin is not really very well suited because uh, the functionality is so broad and we really need uh, when we do chemistry we really need to know what we have so if we have a functionality between oh functionality between whatever uh two and uh, we it's too functional it's very <laughs> so we, we need to know what we have and get get constant qualities that's the biggest problem we have yeah okay thank you very much mm -hmm. any other questions comments Okay. Thank you. You know that there is a plant open in Estonia. They produce lignin, just in case. Yes. <laughs> Maybe they do better. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, to get lignin is is, is no problem. Uh, but uh, we tried a lot. We try to break it down to the monomers. We try to copolymerization to polyvinyl acetate. Co the problem is uh, we cannot copolymerize because it is inhibiting radical uh, polymerization. So we can use it as a stopper, but not as a copolymerizing agent. Oh, because on the website they claim that they produce uh, lignins for PU production. <laughs> Yeah, for foams it, it works uh, for adhesives because the, the uh, properties that we need are so special. It's uh, it's very difficult. It works if you want to replace phenol resins, uh, but that's things. So phenol form aldehyde uh, chemistry that you can partially maybe 40, 50 percent replace with lignin. But we never wanted to go into the formaldehyde business, so that's nothing we are doing as Yovat. So we, for our uh, adhesives, we can basically. So far, we tried a lot in the past ten years on, on projects, but we never succeeded to really uh, successfully use lignin. Perfect. Thank you so much. Ah, sorry, sorry, Olga. Only a comment in relation to this last. No, this is great. Maybe the. The vegetable oils derived products that uh, which have less functionalities than the lignin and the and other substrates could be more uh, adequate for the for the adhesive applications. Thank you. So thank you, Susana, Roman, Harmut, and now is the last session, but not least at all, because sustainability and socioeconomics of biocircularity is, I mean, so, so relevant and important to, and, and is increasingly relevant and important. So we have to take care of all of these uh, aspects. So for that, we have Ana Gomez from Ciroi Engineering Company. Yes. And Ana, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Okay, good morning. Everyone, I am Ana Gomez from Zero Emissions Engineer. Uh, our company, together with Tecnali, are in charge to carry out the impact assessments of ERODI processes. So today I will give you an overview about the sustainability, uh, the general conclu conclusions uh, of the environmental impacts, uh, social considerations, and also the economic feasibility uh, in this type of project because one of the main challenges today is to develop bio-based product superior or at least comparable in term to non-bio-based products in terms of price, availability, performance, and of course, sustainability. So I am going to start uh, with the environmental impacts. Uh, a life cycle assessment have been performed to evaluate the environmental impact uh, in the different erody processes. So uh, this life cycle uh, was carried out uh, according to the standard ISO uh, 140044 that provides the requirements and the guidelines for a life cycle assessment. Uh, including the Golan scope definition, a life cycle inventory, the impact assessments, and the results and interpretation. So for erodic processes, uh, 60, 16 environmental categories, uh, according to the product environment footprint, have been assessed. Also, uh, the main contributing uh, processes and hotspots of each impact category have been uh, identified. Uh, a process improvement and the recommendations towards scaling up have been suggested. And um, finally, a benchmark that uh, allow us to compare the new obtained products versus their conversional uh, ones. Uh, have been performed to, with the purpose to uh, quantify, as I mentioned before, the environmental impacts in this type of process. As you know, uh, this bio-based product uh, reduced the negative uh, environmental impacts, but uh, I found, uh, we found a 
environmental hotspots relate to the energy consumption because uh, among other reasons, uh, the high time of residents required in this time of processes. Also, the life cycle assessment will help to the communication and marketing strategies. For example, this benchmark uh, will allow the stakeholders to compare the bio-based product versus the current ones. And the obtention of the European Eco label will uh, stimulate the market uh, acceptance. Okay, continue with the economic feasibility. When we carry out uh, te the techno-economic assessment, we found these three uh, critical points uh, to be considered to achieve an economic feasibility in this type of projects. The first one is the higher cost of production because uh, we found a higher price of raw materials and solvents and reactants and also the volatility of the feedstock price. The other point to consider is that the fossil-based solutions are significantly lower. The market price of the compared product is very low, lower uh, compared to the sales price of the bio-based product. And the other point is that it's necessary to uh, scale up the processes to achieve profitability solutions. But the question in that point is that there are a, a sufficient a demand. So to improve these points, these critical points, it's necessary to close in the gap between the scientific feasibility and industrial application. Enhancing the strategic cooperation between sectors, new European raw material base reducing the dependence on other regions and increasing the resource efficiency, uh, centralizing uh, integrate biorefineries to improve the process efficiency, and uh, also biorefineries close to the raw materials and to the customers to reduce uh, transport costs and uh, promoting the recycling. And also it's necessary to uh, ensure a market uh, demand approach. And in order to enter in a commercial stage, uh, the processes and technologies need to uh, improve their efficiency and also um, um, improve and optimize uh, the resource use. So it suggests to have a lower requirements, lower energy requirements of mechanical processing a design a robust a industrial processes to produce a stable quality outputs, improving the conversion a processes to minimize a residues and obtain higher value, improve it a logistics and a storage to provide a continuous supply of feedstock and minimize the transport costs, encouraging the reuse and recycling of products, a, a process intensification to improve the efficiency and also the valorization of process and wastewater. Okay, continue with the social impacts. In, the, in that point, we follow the UNAID guidelines that suggest a methodology that include, uh, include the data collection, the system definition, the stakeholders evaluation, a, an indicator selection and a social uh, impact evaluation. Uh, this table show uh, an overview about the potential social hotspots identified in this type of processes. Uh, and for example, it's important to highlight uh, that it's positive in the employees, for example, the creation of employment opportunities, that uh, in the project have good wage and full-time position, uh, the continuous promotion uh, of improvement in the project, the project have ha high quality human resource. Uh, for example, in the customer that they have a new offer of sustainable, uh, of sustainable products. Uh, in the suppliers that are, uh, they strengthen their integration. And for example, in the shareholders that they, uh, 
take advantage of the investments and promote the good uh, governance. And in the local communities, the promotion uh, of the regional uh, development. And for example, in the authorities that they are continue to simulate the research and development. But also we found other points to be improved. For example, uh, some health and safety issues might occur in this type of processes. So it's important to ensure and health and safety procedures in all of the stage of the process, uh, improve the communication between the suppliers and also have good communication between the stakeholders and good cooperation because normally are uh, low. Uh, increase the, the investment in the local communities to uh, promote and to have a high market acceptance in the society. Also, it's necessary to increase the dialogue with the authorities to, uh, uh, to discuss the different uh, regulatory requirements. And uh, it's important that uh, to create an engagement stakeholder plan, plan to disseminate the different information and also, for example, have interviews, workshop with the employees, a service to measure the different impacts of the bio-based products in the customers, a social media plan to uh, facilitate the dissemination of the different results in the communities, um, among others. And finally, continue with the market uptake. Uh, it's important to highlight uh, that the World Economic Forum in one of the reports mentioned that the global bio-based market evaluated at 200, 200 uh, billion by 2020 and mentioned that several companies expressed their ambition to replace, for example, their packaging materials to bio-based materials. But uh, we, fall, uh, we found these following discussion points to be considered in, in the market acceptance. The first one is the potential buyers. The acceptability of the, the bio-based market is high, but the potential buyers are not aware about uh, of bio-based products and often don't understand the exact meaning of the concept. So they have unrealistic expectation about the product performance and these expectations may be lead a uh, market repercussion. The other point is the higher price. One of the main barriers uh, to the market acceptance is the price of the bio-based products because uh, all the stakeholders groups expect uh, the expenditures for bio-based products to be relative high, because as, uh, as I mentioned before, the higher cost of production and the volatility of the feedstock price are the main barriers to the market uh, acceptance. The other point is the environmental impacts. Bio-based products uh, need to ensure a comprehensive set of environmental and sustainability criteria sufficient to justify a premium price. Uh, the other point is the regulation. Uh, if we want to increase the opportunities of the bio-based products in the market, uh, an environmental regulation is needed uh, because now, uh, for example, a stakeholder have an uncertainty about the future regulation and unsupportive regulatory environment. And the other point is the labels. Labels should be considered because if certification is provided, maybe as I mentioned in the social impacts, maybe the different stakeholders uh, really more in the product. Ideally, the label should communicate the whole range of the relevant issues. And finally, the future development of the bio-based market needs a more favorable and a stable regulatory environment, a need to communicate and demonstrate the environmental benefits. It's important that the stakeholders can access to the results of these different projects 
that allow them to compare the bio-based product versus the current one, as I mentioned uh, later. And also it's important to highlight the new functionalities or improved product uh, attributes, because one of the marketing strategy is to position bio-based product as innovative uh, product rather than an eco-friendly product. Companies may be able to get a premium price for a compar for an improved product with new functionalities uh, rather than the environmental advantage. And finally, it's important to strengthen uh, the position of the bio-based product in the different countries. So it's recommended to take uh, the consumer considerations and their unfamiliarity uh, into account to develop a new uh, communication and marketing strategies. And the idea is that there, these uh, strategies be as comprehensive and concrete as possible. Uh, that brings me to the end to the presentation. <laughs> Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Anna, perfectly on time. Uh, uh, just in case, are there any questions, any comments regarding the sustainability and market aspects? Line. We have a lot of challenge. <laughs> yes, I have. I know you are involved in other European projects related, related to biomass. For example, so um, what's your view as an expert on these aspects, socioeconomics and, and environmental? Um, what's your view on, on the trend? You know, so how do you feel this since you start working on these issues some years ago and now? How do you feel the trend is, 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 is going, is, is developing? Because, for example, we can see in some shampoos and lotions and everything is like 100% derivated from vegetables. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, in caps as well in, in, the, in bottles is 100%, uh, packaging is 100% natural or 85% natural. I... I, I um, I agree with you on probably customers don't really know the whole, you know, uh, meaning of being natural or uh, biodegradable. Uh, uh, probably all of them, all of us know that is is good as as the, the more natural, the better, you know, too. But um how do you feel this is going on and how this uh, bio sector that has this such as a, 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 a huge pressure for excellence in terms of sustainability is dealing with this and how the sector is, is evolving in terms of, of being more widened and known and for the general public? Okay, I think that uh, the global biomass market is increased compared to the last years. But for example, I buy a product, for example, with another packaging because I know the concept. And as you mentioned, if uh, it's necessary that the customers uh, know the exact uh, con a meaning of the bio-based products, and their advantage and their environmental impacts, but it's necessary to uh, disseminate this information uh, friendly, yeah. <laughs> compressive and concrete uh, for the general public, because we found uh, a lot of results, but uh, theoretical, <laughs> and it's necessary to disseminate that. And with this information, uh, maybe the customers will really more in these products and also the market uh, increase. Okay. Very good. Yes, there is another question over here. Uh, 
thank you. It's more like a comment related to, to the discussion. It's a lot of greenwashing, right? Like yeah. this is good, this is green, this is natural, recyclable, whatever. Um, how, how can you avoid this uh, in, in European projects and in, in what what can you do to avoid the companies participating in these projects and in general the industry avoids the, the the misuse of the green labels and the miscommunication to the customers are there like measurements that you could take or implement at, the, at least at the local level to to avoid those yeah misunderstandings let's call them <laughs> i don't know if you do you want to no i think the question is Things for, for the whole, yeah, for the whole, project, probably uh -huh. for the whole. I don't know if, for example, Biopad that are in charge to uh, the communication. Or... I mean, we are working on that. It's a challenge as well because this is everything is very technical, very scientific, technical, very, and uh, people has to understand this is a, in in an issue way. So we are working on that. Um, but I think there are many um possibilities going on as well so there are the certification systems there are some um some um um some uh i don't know now the word in english sorry some say or some stamps you know that labels. labels exactly that certificate that this is bio but i think that maybe that what what was done in for example the um, ecological uh agriculture everything that was done in that sector can be a good example because uh now more more consumers are um, more conscious about the the benefits of agricultural uh, ecological agriculture and they know that is good for their health as well for the environment so that process that took years for that sector I think is is a, a good lesson that we can learn. Um, on the contrary, there are some uh, misunderstanding or misinformation or some bad image related to the bio sector. It's like, okay, you are doing this, but are you using forest? Uh, because that lignin, is that coming from forest? Is, is that coming from when it's from waste? There is less less controversy, but when it's from something that a citizen can believe that is natural, it can be from the crops or can be from forest. We have more issues there to explain. You know, um, in in Spain. Um, we have a huge problem with forest fires, for example, and we are working hard to try to communicate that it is important to keep forest clean and well managed in a sustainable way to avoid those huge forest fires. And connecting those concepts with the valorization and utilization of those forest, let's say, excedents because they are not waste in all the cases is something we are working on so um even with our politicians so in the renewable directive that has been um uh, updated the last one and a half year and the european parliament and the european commission and the european council were working three parties together on that it took us a huge effort as well to to make decision makers understand that if they uh, don't allow the valorization and, and the closing of some productive, productive uh, cycles, uh, that can have an impact in nature and habitat and biodiversity and because of the forest fires and everything, it has been such a hard work. We did it at the end, but it cost <laughs> a lot. So. I think th there are a lot of work to do in terms of communication and dissemination at all levels, decision makers, politicians, but as well at, at social levels is something such a relevant and important and even more important than the technologies itself. This is 
this is very important because if we don't have that social license to develop projects, we are not going to be able to do it. And if we don't have that decision-making knowledge and understanding, we are not allowed, we won't be allowed as well to develop our projects. That is something that comes with the bio sector. It doesn't happen with other renewable sector. It's happening now because you know there are many renewable projects, but not with this heavy you know uh, weight on 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 the backs and we have to deal with it so and i think it's very important this kind of uh, meetings where all the the stakeholders are involved industries uh, scientific and everyone be very aware that the in the bio anything related to bio bioenergy bioproducts bioeconomy biorefineries anything uh we have two key issues that is social and environmental aspects. Apart from the scientific technical challenges, the industrial challenges, so, but this is our sector. This is complex by the climate change and the decarbonization of the economy is complex. So for complex problems, we have to provide complex solutions. So this is our, our duty, our challenge, and let's go for it. I don't know if there are maybe one one short comment yes. from uh, industry so we are we are going actually the way of uh, certification uh, we have got ICC plus certification uh, I guess last month I guess we completed that and we use uh, Dean Serco for certified bio-based uh, uh, content but uh, the most important thing is really communication, honest communication, because also yes. certified bio-based doesn't say anything about real carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and it's really difficult uh, still to get information on the raw materials we're using about the real carbon footprint lying behind that. So it's, uh, we're working a lot with uh, other institutes to, to really uh, do life cycle assessment. <laughs> <laughs> okay so it's 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 really difficult still uh, i mean everyone knows the important in, in industry as well but uh, it's still if you're operating globally getting your raw materials from everywhere it's very difficult to to really get trustful data yes two comments over there very good thank you Thank you very much. I would like to, to make a, a very brief conclusion in relation to what Anna has said. Uh, he has exposed very well some points that are critical in the new developments we are, we are doing now. We are developing new technologies that uh, must to compete with technology, fossil, fossil fuel yes. derivative technologies, which are mature, which are completely optimized, we ha uh, which have a very high demand yes. Uh, yes. In, the, in the market. And we have to propose new products that should be as cheap as the fossil uh, products which more have sustainable. more sustainable <laughs> this the other the competence is completely optimized yeah. uh, anna uh, commented about for example uh, resident times or the processes these uh, factors should be improved with the with optimization with the scaling up mm -hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. the demand of the material raw materials uh, it will be increased with the demand of the product one thing scales the other things so we have to compete with in a not uh, a, a, Equiparate, uh, we are in another equiparate com competition, yes. but it's not uh, equal. It's not equal. let's see uh, in the future. Uh, we we have to 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 make this uh, <clears throat> a push that is um, bet this bet yeah. because we know that the future, if we rest with the fossil resources, is uh, is not not very clear so we have to uh, start to, to prepare to to the moment well the the, the definite change should be should be done it's, thank you it will be still <laughs> difficult for industry you cannot compete uh, yeah. yes. fossil one it's a it's a synthetic chemistry it's a cleaner uh, chemistry yeah. i mean it's there is no variability there is no so it's more simpler when you work with vegetable oils 
you have variability, you have a, a lot, a lot of compounds. We talk about DOD. If we talk about what we know uh, in the mm -hmm. but you have maybe hundreds or uh, thousand molecules from PPB, PPM to, so when you have to purify, it's really complex. You have a lot of decontamination, uh, vegetable oil. It's not, uh, it's not uh, how to say safe. We say, uh, okay, nature is safe. No, nature is not safe. <laughs> uh, you have poison. You have a lot of uh, different molecules in oil, in vegetables. So we have to pay attention for that. When we use, okay, cream and, uh, 100 based on a vegetable um, ingredient. Okay, but it's still less active than a cream with only synthetic ingredients. That's why in Japan, they prefer synthetic ingredient or uh, for the squalan, they use the shark squalan mainly because it's the purest. Uh, there are science-based uh, in Japan. So the most important is the activity. It's uh, the quality and to have always the same quality. So they are more focused in synthetic chemistry or something like that. But they use also bio-based, but for the moment, not so much in Asia. It's they change, but they still use a lot of fossil or animal sourcing. So it's not so easy. This question of uh, bio-based, it's uh, we can make a talk about hours about that yeah. because. Yeah. <laughs> Now, one question, maybe for all the other industry representatives. Well, picking up from what you say, the uh, hardwood, do you think that for 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 your customers, it's, because it's the impression that I get that it's more important the the carbon footprint that the bio-based content that we, maybe for the consume for the end consumer is different. It's better to see when you go to the shop. Is people maybe appreciate more saying, okay, 100% plant-based, mm -hmm. but then for the companies, for, for them, for later, for the, for the reports and for, the, for their goals, for the KPIs, it's more important the carbon footprint and that you don't, don't go anywhere saying, okay, I have this additive with 30%, but they will ask you, okay, and how is the carbon footprint compared with the benchmark? In my opinion, uh, behind everything they are publicly saying, actually, mm -hmm. It's basically uh, they want to sell as much as possible. And if the public or social pressure is driving them towards uh, carbon footprint, they, of course, uh, mm. uh, focus on that. Uh, but uh, at the moment, it's really uh, it's, it's, it's either price or uh, what they can. I mean, also greenwashing that happens also, of course. Uh, I mean, they really want to uh, sell their products. And if they feel that uh, you need to have a documented better carbon footprint, then you see they are asking for certificates. They are asking uh, about carbon footprint of our raw materials. In other cases, they, they ask for certificates for bio-based content. So it, it's both, in, it's really driven for them uh, what they feel, what their end customers uh, require. So exactly the, the political uh, the costs, so certificates, CO2 certificates, things like that are really important to, to drive uh, them to really uh, use really uh, sustainable technology because they just want everyone. I mean, it's not, not, it's not so bad to tell that they want to sell. You need to sell. I mean, if you cannot sell, you cannot keep your business alive. So it's, it's not always uh, bad, that's, that's, that's the nature. If you're, you're not selling your products, uh, you're going to be bankrupt someday. And uh, to, uh, for this, in cosmetic, it's more, I think, bio-based due to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Due to yucca, through application like yucca uh, in yucca, the same ingredient, uh, synthetic and bio based, has not, uh, has not the same uh, rating. So you can have, uh, I don't know, two, uh, two, uh, two for uh, a synthetic one and um, 18 for a bio based one. It's the same ingredient. So uh, it's not the. Um, the effectiveness, which is, uh, it's only the sourcing, but it's 
important. I'm not saying uh, I work in uh, vegetable industry, so I prefer this industry and also circular economy. But we have to keep in mind that there is a lot of greenwashing with cherry picking, only what you want to say, or big companies who ask the money to, to plant a lot of trees and then to, to lower their footprint. But in reality, what is a reality? So uh, it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that uh, discussion, uh, when we talk about who wants to see sustainability certification, another one that I've heard multiple times from, from industrial partners is that they want to show investors because investors also want to see that type of certification. So they keep coming to me ask like, can you give me life cycle analysis certification? Because investors also want to see this. So it's not just the, the consumer, but uh, there are the, the, the green-minded investors out there too that want to see these things, I think. And it's been changing a lot in the recent years, you can say. I mean, 10 years, we, we do, we're doing a lot of green projects uh, since about 15 years. In the first five years, we had very good results, but almost no demand. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Now we're getting to com more complicated topics. The res results are getting still good sometimes. Some are not so good, but, um, but the demand is really... Hmm. exponentially yes. higher than it used to be 10 years ago right it's a great time to be working in the bioeconomy yes. yes exactly perfect so i don't know if there are any comments or questions from online Okay, so then I think we can finish. Thank you so much for being with us, with us this morning and uh, congratulations to all the Irodi project partners. What a great work, what a great project. We don't want to finish this project. <laughs> we want to continue working together and evolving these technologies and yes and make uh, great things for the bio and the and the chemi and the chemistry uh, industries thank you to olga pablo tecnalia coordinators of this project and yes we will work in together until august this year all the presentations will be in the website as well as the recording of this session will send anyway to all the participants the presentations and the and the recording and uh, thank you thank you very much this is the beginning of very big things together independently so let's go for it thank you very much thank you I think, uh, I think I, uh, but I didn't do nothing. Yeah, right. So I have nothing to.